Welcome back to Believe in Badgers on the Believe Network, presented by betonline.ag and Oak Bridge Wealth Management. I'm Matt Perkins, joined, as always, by Badger legend, the Hebrew Hammer himself, Matt Bernstein. Bernie, how you doing today? Matt Perkins, it's always... First off, if we ever get a show with three Matts on, it's like the best show we could possibly have. Uh, Mr. Matt LePay, I am so sorry. I have to apologize first. Because we have a lot of listeners who are very mad at me for not putting you on our, my mat wall, which Mount Matt I t- woke up. We had a mat wall, and I totally woke up mid middle of the night, and I texted Matt Perkins, and "Go, oh my god, I didn't put Matt LePay on my mat wall." And I swear I could bring it up. It was like one forty-five in the morning. Completely. I mean, I did just have a kid a couple months ago, so my brain works very slowly. <laughs> I mean, I also played fullback, and Coach White two weeks ago said that I took a lot of hits. So it's a majority, it's a combination. Of but we are so, you know, thrilled to have the voice. I have so many questions. Um, you've seen the, pretty much the history of Wisconsin, but I'll let Matt Perkins continue because uh, I'm just really fired up. I mean, him. Bernie, you said it all. We've got the voice of the Badgers. It's Matt LePay. If you're listening to this podcast, you know exactly who this man is. Recent inductee into the Wisconsin Broadcasting Hall of Fame, voice of the Badgers for uh, 30 years for football, 36 years for men's basketball. And uh, he's done it all for the Badgers. And we are honored, honored, I say, that you are here with us today, Matt LePay. Uh, uh, the honor is mine. And Brie, I, I do recall we did have a little social media back and forth where you fessed up of leaving me off the Mount Matmore. And I think I expressed my deeply hurt feelings, but I, I was digging deep and I was able to survive the blow and move on. So that's that's OK. No, it's great to be on. I mean, Ber- when Bernie was playing, I don't think my hair was quite this snowy. So uh, I'm old. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, the, the Hall of Fame thing is like, this guy's old, better get him in. So um, good to be on with you guys. Well, it's great. It's great to have you. Congratulations. You have your hair, which is great. <laughs> and if I ever got it longer, I would be very close. That's why I keep it very short. <laughs> um, it also makes me look skinny and I'm not. So <laughs> that's why <laughs> I wear, I wear black all the time. And the same thing. It just makes me look yeah. a little bit thinner. All I have is like red. I, I, that's it. All <laughs> UW red stuff. Um, that's not true. But a lot of majority of my clothing is Wisconsin, uh, which is so cool. Before we get into it, want to remind everyone tuning in that we are presented by betonline.ag. BetOnline is your number one source for all of your sports betting needs this season. From baseball, golf, soccer, right up to all the top fights in MMA and boxing. Every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads while the games are being played. When the game's over, head on over to our online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker. Or unwind with one of our over 150 different slot games. Head on over to the website today to get in on the action. Use our promo code BELIEVE for your 50% free bet credit on your first deposit up to $250. That's B L E A V. Bet online. The game starts here. Also, want to remind you that we are proud to be brought to you by Chris Anasetti and Oak Bridge Wealth Management. Attention pro and future pro athletes. Chris Anasetti is the man that you need to connect with to get your money right. At Oak Ridge, Chris and his team of professionals will create a comprehensive financial plan to set up you to navigate your lifestyle and future market conditions. Oak Ridge specializes in wealth management for professional athletes. They understand all of the pressures that athletes face on and off the field. Chris and his team will set you up with a bespoke plan to make your money work for you off the field so you can focus on what you do best perform on the field. So get in touch with Chris on Instagram at Oakbridge underscore Anacete. That's Oakbridge underscore A-N-I-C-E-T-E. Or head on over to their website at oakbridgewealthmgmt.com. Oakbridge Wealth Management. So Matt LePay, you are, I mean, pretty much you're the voice of the Badgers. To me, that's so amazing. How does that begin? Where does little Matt LePay say, I want to get on TV or I want to get on broadcasting. I want to be the voice of the Badgers. Like, how does that, you know, from growing up to become now, you know, in the Hall of Fame, not the Hall of Old People, the Hall of Fame uh, in Wisconsin. I just think it's, I just think your story is fascinating. It, it, it is something I, I wanted to do ever since I was pretty young. Um, I mean, like most, I wanted to 
you know, I wanted to play professional sports. I mean, for me, baseball was my first love, but I loved all sports. But by the time I got to high school, I realized that's probably not happening. Um, so my old line is, guys, not good enough to play, not smart enough to coach. But I could be around it as a broadcaster. That that just I, growing up, I would I would hear announcers, guys who I really liked. If it was you know baseball announcers or whatever, I thought you get paid to do this. This is pretty good. If I could find somebody crazy enough to pay me to do this, when you're starting out, you're not paid much. Uh, it's more in pennies, nickels, and dimes. But it's just it's it's fun to be around it, and I think the connection with the team. I, I talked to somebody I know who has done a lot of national stuff in his career. Uh, he had he had been the he had worked locally at at a, at a major university and had been more national network, NFL network, a couple of other platforms. And he was telling me recently how much he missed being around a team, uh, where even as a broadcaster, you you kind of ride that emotional roller coaster a little bit not nearly as much as as you as a player but as a broadcaster and you start to get to know guys a little bit and that's the fun part for me just i mean the games are obvious but just you know being able to you know reconnect with you again bernie and 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 you know seeing some of the former players that you that you guys have interviewed um you know the thing that you do with brian white and you had anthony davis on here recently that was really cool because those are two guys i've got a ton of respect for um, and it's it just, it was really fun to, to listen to those memories. And, and the same thing when I connect with guys who played even as far back as the late eighties, when I arrived, it, you may not see somebody for five, 10, 15 years, but when you see them again, you start reminiscing. And that's part of the, that that's maybe as cool a part of this job as anything I do. So I got to ask you then, which one of your former players that you've seen is the best at broadcasting. Let's take out Tauscher. We're going to talk about him later. I wanted. I, I want to talk about Tauscher later. But who, which, which of the players that you've seen or that you worked with are there? Be like, hey, like that person. I think would be a really good at broadcasting. Well, I think you know Brandon Williams dabbled in it. I don't know if he's doing a whole lot of it now, but I I, I think he's somebody who's who's pretty good, uh, really good actually. I, I don't know if he has. Uh, thoughts of trying to get back in or not. Um, you know, a lot of people try it and then they decide they want to get a real job. And that's very, that's very understandable. This would be the non Matt Bernstein category probably because Bernie has obviously established himself very well as a former player turned broadcaster, at least as a, as a little side hustle. Uh, I'm trying to think, uh, I mean, Randy Wright did it for quite a while. The, the quarterback uh, at Wisconsin back in the eighties, he doesn't do it anymore, but he was, he was really good at it when he did it, uh, both on radio and and television. I'm trying to think of some other guys through the years, some some former Badgers. Well, it's um, not it's not necessarily football, but obviously Owen Daniels on the weather is uh, outstanding. Oh, that, that's yeah, that's a category all its own. Od was OD, great tight end, great weatherman. He's the he's the best, absolutely. We well, got Brian Butch. Oh, I'm sure. Just thinking of yeah. guys from the day. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's fantastic. I like watching. Also, I, I like him. So it's fun to watch people you like, mm -hmm. uh, on, on the national broadcast. Like, do you ever watch somebody? Do you think there's any football players who are better than you have a Tony Romo and you have a bunch of other guys for you? Are there any dudes you watch nationally? You're like, man, this guy's pretty sharp and he's pretty good at it. Yeah. Greg Olson, uh, who was on the number one team and now, you know, how this business works. Um, Tom Brady is, which who I think is going to be very good, but Greg Olson, I, I think is excellent. And he's going to work with somebody who I know Joe Davis, uh, who went to school at Beloit college. He's from Michigan, but he's a Beloit college graduate and the voice of the Dodgers and calls the world series. So that's going to be, if you want to call that a number two team or a three team, whatever, it's a really good uh, tandem, I think with Joe and, and Greg Olson. Those are, yeah. Um, um, a, another guy who I've, I've gotten to know a little bit through the years, he worked, he was at ESPN ABC for a while. He's done BT and stuff. Matt Millen, great freaking dude. Um, I mean, obviously a terrific player. Um, I know the, the whole, general manager thing with the lions maybe didn't go great, hey, listen, but not everyone a, can be great at everything. Yeah. You can't be great at everything, but if you're great in two out of three um, and he's got a million stories to tell, he's, you know, he went through a really you know major health issue a few years ago and he's come back and he's still calling games and, and he's, he's really terrific. I mean, the, the list is really long of, of guys right now. I think bro who broadcasters who are 
really good at what they do. You know, the analyst, the, the, the former player perspective, I think has, has great value. But a lesson that a couple of us have talked about that here in Wisconsin, the key to it all is as a former player, be develop into a broadcaster who played. Don't just be the jock moving into the booth. Uh, there's a difference. And, and the people you see at the network level, and, you know, Tauscher, is a broadcaster who played. Brian Butch is a, you know, they're really into the craft. Brian Butch, a broadcaster who played. That, that can be easier said than done, but those guys and, and, you know, so many that you see on the national platforms are really good at learning the craft of broadcasting. And then you bring that, that having played component to a, to a uh, telecast or, or any kind of a broadcast, if it's radio or television, that's priceless. So as a broadcaster, how did you hone your voice, both in terms of like actual like vocal qualities and timbre and stuff like that, and also your delivery style? Yeah, I never went to like a voice coach, and maybe I should have, because I do get I get lazy voice sometimes, like in a setting like this, I'll slump, my posture's crappy, and it, it just it doesn't project the way the way it should, but I do. I'll listen back. We call them air checks, self air checks. I'll listen back to a broadcast, even like in the summer months. Um, I'll kind of spot check myself at a, at a couple of football games late in the year. Um, not the whole game, but parts of it. Just okay. What am I? Am I doing this right? What can I do better? Am I giving Tauscher enough space, or or Brian Butch, you know, the the, the right amount of space in a basketball broadcast? Because when you do it a few months later. You forget all that happened in a game, so I'm relying on my own description there, and I, I check to see if I'm doing it right. Um, but th- that's probably as much as anything. And if it's if it gets really off base in the social media world now, um, or or whoever, they'll let me know. Um, so, but most of it is a self air check. Just am I am I am I projecting right? Am I painting the picture right? Are we having fun? Does it make it? Are we giving the listener the the impression there's no place we would rather be? Because I really, it's the truth. There is no place we'd rather be on a Saturday in the fall or a couple Fridays now, with the, the schedule being what it is, or basketball games. Um, I mean, it's uh, it does beat working. That's for sure. Yeah, it absolutely okay. does. And you know, I've got to say, you know, you've been because of, of these jobs all around the country and you've gone to, I can't even imagine how many different stadiums and things like that. What is the best and worst broadcast booth that you've worked in outside of Camp Randall, and the Cole center? The worst is uh, I think it's called hard rock stadium, Miami, Miami. the orange bowl. Yep. When, when the Badgers beat Miami down there in, in 2017, great game. You're in, great game. You're in, it was a great game. Um, at least I'm pretty sure it was. We, we called most of it off of a monitor. Uh, we're in an enclosed booth, enclosed booth in Miami, in the corner, deep back corner of you know the end zone. So you're really, if they're coming at you, that's fine. But if it's going to the other end, you're in trouble. But I hate enclosed radio booths. We, we like open windows. And the second worst, I mean, having been there for a Brewers series seven, eight years ago was great, but for the bowl game at Yankee Stadium, you're still in, I'm in John Sterling's or what what used to be John Sterling's radio booth. So field goals and PATs were great. That's where we were. We were in the end zone. We were behind the goalpost. So again, anything coming at us was good. Anything going away um, where we have, we just went off of the television monitors. So those were the, but it's Yankee stadium. I'm not going to call that the worst Miami. I will, uh, the best, you know, the best one right now. And I think it surprises people. Ross age stadium. Purdue. Purdue. They renovated it several years ago and the sidelines are great. You got all the space in the world that it just as a working booth, you know, sight lines, all of that, um, that's probably the best. So, so Matt, I got to ask you football. You do a lot of pregame work. You mentioned it before the crap football takes from Sunday to Friday night, sometimes Saturday morning to get ready for the game. What does the voice do? I assume you have to do a ton. You're not just showing up to the stadium and, you know, using some Epsom salt and just jumping in. <laughs> you, you must have 
a ton of pre-checks and things you guys do. What, what does that look like? Yeah, for me, because I'm not very smart, I need to look at stuff for a long time. So I'm at, as you know, Bernie, I, I'm at practice, you know, at least two or three days a week. And it, and the coaches are very uh, generous about that because, you know, the writers, most of the media, they're, the practice is close to them. Um, but there's a trust with, with us. We're able to observe because I'm not reporting. I'm not saying that, you know, Matt Bernstein just broke off another 80 yard run against first team defense, you know, or, or whatever. I'm not giving no JT any, here. Oh, no yeah. JT. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm not giving a play, not tweeting a, a play by play of practice, but that just, that enables me to see, just get, get a feel for, you know, the team's preparation, uh, the type of defenses and offenses it's going to face week in and week out. And as you get into the season, I'll look at at least two or three of the most recent games of the opponent. Now, obviously, early in the year, it's that's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, but as you get into the year, like the opener, the, the Big Ten opener, they'll play out at USC. You know, the Trojans will have had three or four, at least three games played. So I'll be able to look back at those and and just the, the most simple things. You're just getting names and numbers. You want to get them. You want to get them memorized. Uh, I don't have a spotter, so I just need to know this. I need to know who number 10 is, number 15 at the snap of a finger. Kind of simple stuff, but stuff you have to know. Um, I'll interview, uh, you know, uh, at least a handful, if not more, Badger players during the course of a week. Luke Fickle and I will will get together a couple times a week, and then, you know, Tauscher and I will watch a practice together and, you know, maybe have dinner on Friday night before a road game, that type of thing. Um, but yeah, it's a lot. I don't know how many hours it is. I don't count them, but I just, I know when I'm, when I'm tired of looking at it, um, that I'm ready. I mean, I, you guys, I mean, it's nowhere near what you guys did in terms of preparation, but I just, I want Saturday to be the, the fun day because of the work you put in during the week. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a, pretty much the same with football is you want Saturday to be the fun day because it sucks when it's not the fun day. <laughs> but, but Matt, you mentioned, I mean, I have to assume with the transfer portal now, your job is so much harder because it's almost like the NFL, like dudes are in and out now. So so how how much more do you have to put in because of the transfer portal? How much more do you have to go interview people? How much more does it change? Maybe year to year, not so much week to week, but it seems like, you know, you don't have guys just graduate and new guys come in as freshmen. It's a jumble all over the place. So so what's that been like in, in the broadcasting uh, view? That's where you know, spring practice has been really valuable for me just to observe. Again, I'm, I'm not tweeting out what I'm seeing. I know, you know, the practices are open. The media, uh, it, the general media gets much more access to, to spring practice and, and they're putting out a lot more stuff. But for me, it's just, uh, okay, this is Jaheen Thomas. Uh, this is Tackett Curtis. These are some of these new linebackers, Leon Lowry, just getting an idea of, of what they look like and how they move and real general stuff like that. And you're right, Bernie, it's not just, you know, here's Gideon Atuka, an early entry freshman, or, you know, Rob Booker out of, out of Wanakee. Uh, you get a little familiar with those. Obviously, you're getting familiar with those guys, but it's the additional new faces with the portal. I don't... You know, I think uh, and Luke has talked about this, Luke Fickle, that he, you still want he still wants to be primarily a high school recruiting right. uh, type of uh, staff. But there's a reality. But if you've got needs that you need filled now, you hit the portal, and this staff has been very aggressive in doing that, and, and seemingly pretty successful. So the thing that I've noticed in a very general sense with these linebackers in particular. Um, they got some guys who look like dudes. I mean, they've got, they wanted a little bit more length, a little bit more twitch, all those coaching terms. I think they found that with, with some of these guys. So now we'll see how that continues to develop in, in, into the fall. But that that's for me, a big part of the spring and, and just, you know, again, seeing, uh, seeing Braden lock. Okay. Is he continuing to get better and, and so on and so forth. Just getting familiar where spring spring practices are always important, even for broadcasters. I think even more so now. Yeah. So, so I have a culture question before Matt Perkins jumps in coming from New York. I went there, I read some articles of, you know, what's going on. I watched a few of the games on TV, although the games were kind of brutal because it was the shoebox year and you had no idea who was playing and you're know, trying to win. And the team wasn't that bad. It's just, they had so many different starters. But when I got there, you know, you, you do see people who are always around the program like you and like some others. And then you learn about who these people are and the culture becomes, 
oh man, Matt LaPay is talking to me. This is important. And I'm not pumping you up. I just think it's actually really cool. Does that change? Has that changed? Because guys are so much older now. They're not, you know, like freshmen coming in and you're watching AD, you know, talk to you about what's going on. And you're like, man, I might be that guy one day, you know, and then you become that guy. And it's so exciting. Like, does the culture around, I guess, you know, you and, and your career and how pristine it is, like, does that, does that still have some weight when you have guys transfer in and new coaches and all these different kind of components to football? It's, it's an interesting question, Bernie, because I think, you know, in a lot of cases, guys aren't here as long. And now it's like, well, I'm talking to the gray haired guy. Who's he? You know, it's like <laughs> you're here for guys are here for a year uh, or, or a couple of years. So uh, it is, I think that's, that's just where we are in college athletics, where, you know, you, I got to know you through your entire career and, you know, guys like, you know, Bollinger and, you know, we could go on and on, uh, you know, through the years, uh, Lee Evans. I saw Lee at, he was at one of the spring practices, uh, mm -hmm. late, you know, the, one of the last practices they had and just, you know, seeing him again. Um, it's going to be interesting to me. It's really, it, it's, it's a real interesting question there because we've talked about that, Bernie, over the years uh, or the last year or two. You know, I don't know how many more years we're going to have a freshman go all the way through and then graduate uh, four years later. I mean, you'll have some, but you may not have as many. You'll have guys coming in for one year or two max or a freshman who may be a sophomore somewhere else. So that dynamic over the next few years is going to be interesting. And, you know, hopefully with, with some of these guys, you get to know them even in a brief period of time that, there's always a connection there, more importantly with the teammates than with a broadcaster. But I'm kind of bracing for that maybe to to reduce a little bit. It's nobody's fault. It's just where we are in college athletics, and, and guys may not be hanging around the same school for four or five years. Wait, Matt Perkins, do you know this? If you play in three different programs or five or one or two, are you, are you an alumni of all of them? <laughs> I feel like I've had this argument with the Buckingham Club of – if you transfer out, but you've played, a, if you lettered at Wisconsin, are you an alumni, but you left and played some, I think, I mean, my personal opinion here is, it, it, I think yes, it is, but here's what I think. If you either your last year as a player was with the program or you graduated from the university with a degree while you were playing for them, then you are an alumnus of the program. Matt LePay thoughts. I think it, I, I, listening to you guys talk about that, I mean, to me, someone like Chimray DK, who transferred to Florida, but to me, like it, when he comes back, and hopefully he will, that he can be embraced by everyone. Jordan Turner. I, Jordan Turner. Yeah, same I thing. think. I mean, I, I Chimray got a degree. I know. Um, like Ch I, Chimray, I'm pretty sure graduated with you know a, an undergraduate degree before yeah. transferred, and so like, oh, I would absolutely consider someone like that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's a blank. I don't know if there's a blanket answer to yeah. that, but I think, in, you know, sure. individual cases for sure, uh, because you never know, you know, sometimes it's NIL opportunities. Sometimes it's like, well, you know, this, this position group, this room is pretty crowded now, and maybe I've got a better opportunity somewhere else. You have coaching changes. Um, I mean, Chim is the first guy who came to mind because he's a, he's a great guy for one mm -hmm. thing. And he was a really, he was a good, really good player here for what they were you know trying to do at Wisconsin. Um, but he kind of saw a better opportunity down in Gainesville and hopefully he can, you know, make his last year of college a, a real good one. But you know, there are others who, you know, maybe you're just kind of, it, it's almost, it's much more transactional and that's understood. That's fine. But I don't know how well some of those guys would be embraced moving forward. It'll be interesting to well, see well, someone like a guy like Chucky. Yeah. Uh, who's, I mean, listen, for $700,000, mm -hmm. I will literally go to almost every school except for one. And I might go to that one school that I hate more <laughs> than anything. Cause that's a lot of money. And it's, it's not fair. Cause Matt LePay, as you are old, you are still growing up during this. You're still in this time period. Matt Perkins and I have grown up and I played during a time when you literally couldn't accept a ride if it was snowing out and you didn't have shoes on, like they wouldn't let you get in a booster's car or anyone's car. Cause you didn't know. So to me, it's so hard to think about. This is a tangent. We didn't need to go down, but I think if you blood, sweat and tears, you went to camp and you played in those games and you worked your butt off and you lettered and you want to transfer because there's whatever reason 
I think you should be part of that alumni. Now, should you get into the Buckingham Club? Maybe that's a different story um, because why should I not get in when I played four and a half years here? But that's a whole nother can of worms that we could, <laughs> we could talk. First off, there's a bar there. So like, I really want to get in, um, but that's neither here nor there. But I think it's an interesting thought, Matt, with you, yeah. you know, you, you know, like the culture has shifted no matter what we want to hold on to or what we think. Um, so I just, from broadcasting, like it must be so interesting, so difficult to try to learn a person when they could leave the next Well, I year. think the perfect yeah. test case for this is AJ Store. I think that I think that is like is AJ Store a Badger? He's it's what his fourth college in four years. Like I, I don't know what he, maybe maybe in twenty twenty four he doesn't have to quote unquote belong to a university. Well, it also might be. Um, oh, sorry, Matt. But it also might be like he just might n- come back and nobody really knows who he is because he was here for one year and he didn't build his brand of in, as a Badger. So there could be some of that being played. I, I don't know. I, it's uh, you said it, Matt. It's it, who knows. It's by player by player. Probably. Yeah, I, I think we'll probably get used to it. I've told, I've suggested to fans that it's important that we all try to understand it, but it's up to you as a fan whether you want to accept it. And I, I think you know maybe the younger the younger fan base will just kind of grow with this and they, this is a part of it and fine. If they're here for a year and they move on, um, it is like professional sports. I'll give you a case in point with the, with the Milwaukee Brewers. CC Sabathia was a brewer for about half a year. What a, and what a half season. It was an oh unbelievable God. half of a season. He almost uh, and then he moved on, the but league. he walks back into Milwaukee and and, and sure. rightfully so, uh, it, it is the the royal treatment. Um, Same with Sprewell out of nowhere, but yeah, yeah, I get it. But you know, Chucky, I think uh, Chucky Hepburn is a guy again, a great, really good dude, really good dude, and he gave a lot for for Wisconsin basketball. Hit one of the biggest shots we have ever seen at the Cole Center in the history of the program uh, as a freshman to beat Purdue and, and win a piece of the Big Ten championship and. Yeah, I think you talk to to players of even five years ago, but ten or fifteen said, "Yeah, you know, I kind of get it." And it always makes me wonder. Like I watch college basketball, I'll get off on a tangent now, and I see who's you know, winning the national championship, who's getting into the final four. I'm thinking, "Oh, UConn is really, really good, but are they better than the fifteen Wisconsin Badgers?" Um, I don't know, but. If the portal was available in those years, how many would have moved on? Maybe there would have been a few, uh, you may, maybe not starters, but rotation guys who would have had better opportunities. There's a guy right now in college basketball, finished his career at Illinois. He's going to go to Kansas State and apparently make $2 million. He ain't Frank Kaminsky. It makes me wonder what Frank would have made in college after his junior year when he wanted to come back for one more year and ended up winning the Naismith Player of the Year Award. So we don't, it's easy to say this generation isn't as good as that generation, but we don't know what teams would look like. I mean, Bernie, would you have been a Badger for four, four or five? You know, it, it's it's funny. I, I would say yes, but I don't know because the world is so, I just would have been happy with getting some sort of, I mean, outside of like all the free booze I could drink at Wando's, like, <laughs> out of, got to get my Wando's plug in every time we do this. Um but, but it's interesting. I, I would say yes, because my position probably is not like the hottest position out there. Mm-hmm. But but would the door like like Owen Daniels, who became he came as a quarterback, got hurt and then became one of the best tight ends to ever leave the program. Mm-hmm. Would he have gone? You know, would some of the dudes I came in with Brandon Williams, you know, Brett Bell, all these guys who might not have been like I'm not saying any one of them had any issues. But you're right, though. I don't know if the guys I came in with would have been the guys that I left with at the end. And that's kind of weird. And I don't know that question. I mean, my heartstring is Wisconsin, so I'd say yes, but that's not fair because I didn't see one dollar really when I was there. Um, but I also but feel I like Bernie, Bernie, you saw whacked Bernie, out. you saw the field pretty early. Like you were see, you saw the you saw the field as red for redshirt freshman. And so like you didn't have as much a weight as some other people did. So also, you know, I'm just thinking your personality. I don't think you're going anywhere. No, I think Wisconsin, I think Madison won my heart more than the Big Ten and, and football. I mean, football was why I went there. Wisconsin was the coolest place I think I've I, – it's Madison's – the coolest place I've ever been outside of Israel. It's my number one place. So I get to work and live and go back to the, my number one place and go watch football and 
be a part of the Badgers. Even, you know, like I go on the field to just watch practice. It's so cool. Those guys don't know me. I don't, you know, like I, I know who they are. They don't know who I am. It's really cool. Matt Lepay, to get back to your question, I think I would have stayed. It would have had to drive something huge in my direction to let me, to get me out of there. And I don't know what that would have been. You know, listen, we had Barry the whole time. We were competing for Big Ten championships. I had Coach White, who I thought, now know that John Palermo got me to Wisconsin. Coach White didn't want me. Um, (laughs) But like a guy who made me better every day for four years. I don't know how you, you know, they really, those guys cared tremendously. A JD who really, you know, I got, I don't know. I don't know how you, I don't know how you don't just love a place with all the people and, and think outside of getting paid a lot of money, this isn't the place for me. Just think how much money, Bernie, you would have made hurdling those dudes at Penn State. The T-shirts that would have come out, I mean, that hurts, doesn't it? That's a lot, so, that's a lot of this jerseys, that just kind of went by the boards. So it's, it, it, so it's funny. They had a store on State Street called Lids, and we walked by it once, and they had a, a red hat with a 45 on it. My mom's like, what is that? And I'm like, I don't know. I've never seen it before. So we went in and on the, on the, where you can um, snap, you know, on the back across the top, it said Bernstein. My mom's like 45 Bernstein. Is this that football player guy? And the, you know, the guy in the background's like, yeah, I think so. And my mom's like, I'm going to take all your hats that say it was five of them. And the guy's like, why? And it's like, that's my son right there. And that's his number with your, <laughs> his name on the back of it. And we thought nothing of it. Like not even, I should have seen any money, you know, 45 was being sold in the, in the bookstore, never thought one second, like I should be getting paid for this. The only thing I thought I should be getting paid was for the video game. Cause I'm like, that is a fat yeah. white guy with 45. It has to be me. Um, Not so, a fat guy, so, uh, 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 put together guy, big weight room warrior guy. Come on. You, you're okay. Fine. Thank you, Matt. Okay. <laughs> I was a lumbering slow dude in the game. Believe me, we don't, that's another deep hole EA. I'll, I'll be contacting your lawyers. I think sooner, sooner rather than later. Um, but wait, Matt, okay. You, you, you mentioned like guys out of state, you know, like, especially for me, AD, you had Ron Dane. We can get into Ron Dane. I want to talk about Barry. But what's it like to, you know, have guys from different areas come to Wisconsin, embrace the football, the program, the people, you know, you talk to a lot of people who are not Brooks Bollinger. He's not from Wisconsin. Like some people didn't even know this place exists and they come and they live here and they love it. What's it like for you to be a broadcaster to be like, I know this guy cares so much for this team more than almost every, anything he really cares about in, in the world. It's probably one of the things, maybe the only thing I have in common with, with you guys, because I didn't grow up in Wisconsin either. I grew up mm-hmm. in Ohio. So when, when I moved here, I was 26 years old. So you, I learned to love it pretty quickly. I mean, what's not to love, right? You go to the terrace on a summer day or in the fall. You go to Camp Randall when you've got you know, 75, 80,000 people going crazy. Uh, it's pretty easy to fall for all of that. And, um, and I, and I see guys from out of state, if it's you, if it's Ronnie, you know, Brooks from North Dakota, uh, taking it in, uh, guys from Cali, you know, Joey Bose from California, um, you know, coming here and, and really loving it and embracing it. It's, uh, it's pretty cool to see. And I, it's like I said, it's the one thing I can relate with you guys because I'm not, I'm not a, you know, lifelong cheese head either, but I became one when I, when I moved, I've lived in Wisconsin longer than I've lived in Ohio now. So that, that part is, is really cool. Just in, but the, the big thing, Bernie, is just how watching how you guys, uh, you watch the bond between you guys as teammates. I mean, you mentioned the, you know, when you had B white on and Anthony Davis, I don't know how often you talk with those guys, but you know, it seemed like you had, just talk the day before and then the day before that all everything just comes back together again um if you're from wisconsin or not uh but i I think even if you're not you're you're a wisconsinite now and there's always going to be part of that in in brooks and in ron and in ad and and so on and so forth and you just you fall in love with the culture the school your teammates coaches maybe in retrospect with coaches, maybe in the moment, not so much, but then you realize, oh, okay, I know what he's, I know what he's doing now. Sure. Um, that part is, is a lot of fun, a lot of fun to watch. What made you fall in love with Wisconsin? Because you're not a rich, you're not a native to the state. So yeah, it's a corny answer, 
Matt, but it, it is, it's the people. I mean, you know, the buildings are better. They've renovated the stadium. They're going to, you know, develop this great indoor practice facility for, for football here in the next few years, and which is necessary. It's a really important, but as corny as it is, it's the people inside. I tell people, and I have to be careful how I put it because I'm afraid you could, people are going to get offended. It isn't always because of the W on the helmet or the Wisconsin on the chest why I like these guys and want them to win. It's because you start to know these, these people. And as a broadcaster, we know just enough to be dangerous what you guys put into this every week. I mean, as a broadcaster, we pull for you. Fans at times, you know, they'll live and die by it. But no one's going to care more than players and coaches and athletic trainers and street coaches and managers and all of that. Uh, and just watching, you know, watching how all of that develops, how all of that comes together. And I, I and I just think at, at Wisconsin, Barry would always say it's hard to win. And they, yeah, but you, you've got you've got the the free pub programs, as Bo Ryan would always refer to it, you know, the blue bloods. And in football, we know who they are. And it's always extra extra special to see those games where Wisconsin knocks some of these schools off the pedestal. You know, Bernie at 2004 at Ohio State. Talk to Barry, you know, as we always would do a couple of days before the game. And enough time has elapsed now. He didn't say it on the air. He said it off the air. He said, I think we're better than they are. Thinking, really? You're better than Ohio State, huh? And you were, you pounded him. And Anthony gets it again and again and again and again as the game is winding down, and the little scrap at the uh, at the logo at midfield. You, you two programs had the little logo dance going back and forth, and there's Joe Thomas with the helmet off and a big beating grin on his face. Yep. You know, come and get me, come and get me, and no one did. Um, <laughs> those are the things that that's what draws me to Wisconsin. Just seeing guys like that, seeing how much they love being a Badger, how much they love playing for each other. And, you know, maybe every school has that. I don't know. I don't care. I just think at Wisconsin, it's really, really noticeable. Okay. Hold on. So we, we, we have two tangents. I want to go down special games because that Ohio State game to me was super special. Dante's dancing on the O because he's an Ohio guy and they didn't, and Ohio State didn't want him. And his brother went there and he got everyone fired up. And I think Barry probably felt that energy that Dante's brought the whole week. And, and as Matt, you're probably there, Matt LaPay, sorry, during practice, watching this dude get amped and getting everyone else excited because we're going back to his home turf. I've never been more excited because they had the three of the best linebackers in the Big Ten. And I was like, I think I'm the best fullback. I want to show these dudes that that's the truth. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think Barry built this up, but I want to talk about Barry because this dude changed the entirety of Wisconsin, the, the entire state trajectory. If you really look at it, um, the university for sure. What was it like when that did like, tell us before, tell us after, I mean, you were there in the eighties doing basketball. What was the hype about football? Cause JD said they had great dudes. Don Davey was one of them. Great guys. They just want cohesive. What did Barry do when he came? Like, what what did he do? Like, what was so exciting when he showed up? Yeah, there were there were great dudes and some really great players, just not nearly enough. I mean, you mentioned Don Davey. There was Troy Vincent um, right. and, and some other guys as well who, like, okay. And, uh, and Barry, to this day, would say he would he could name off a bunch of guys that he would have loved to have coached for another two, three years, but they just their eligibility ran out. They maybe had their senior year in 1990 but everybody who was around remembers um you know he had coached he was at notre dame with lou holtz they had won the orange bowl he flies into madison has next to no sleep gets introduced and you know there's already some excitement because you heard the name and there was instant national pub you know the, the orange bowls on nbc and they're they're talking the pregame about hey wisconsin you know, a program that has really struggled for a while now is going to hire this hot assistant from Notre Dame who had options. You know, Wisconsin wasn't his only choice. So, you know, Barry with no sleep, and he's still, you know, feeling pretty good about himself. He has many things, including a confident guy. And he got a little – somebody had asked him a question. And I, I don't remember he, – he, he doesn't want to say who it was. But he thought it was kind of a snarky tone. To like, you know, what makes you think you can, you know, you can turn this around, you know, whatever. 
And that's where Barry had the famous line about you better get your season tickets now because before long you might not be able to. And I'm standing back there hearing that. There were fewer than 30,000 people announced for the last game of 1989. There were closer to 10,000 who were there. I'm thinking, really? <laughs> it's like, I was really you better get your season tickets now. And even the first year when they won one game, and it was a year that, but by Barry's own admission, it, it almost killed him because he just wasn't used to losing. But they would hang in there. They were outmanned. And they would hang in there for a half, for three quarters against teams that they probably had no business being within 40 points of. And you just thought, okay, this is a one-win team, but you could see some things happening. In year two, year three, you know, they were very, very close to being bowl eligible, had a heartbreaking loss at the end of 1992. And then in 93, everything, it, it all came together. And that first recruiting class of his in 90, they were now veteran players, you know, guys like Yusef Burgess and Eric Unverzat. And then you get young guys like, you know, Pete Monte, Tarek Sala coming in, not to mention the quarterback, Daryl Bevel, Brent Moss, Terrell Fletcher. I mean, guys who were just, as each week went by, they just believed more and more. And you, you always, some coaches don't like, People in my business saying this, but Bernie, you tell me, I think teams can take on the personality of a head coach. And without a doubt, we were seeing that at Wisconsin. Joe Panos, after a, a win at Indiana, why not Wisconsin? Why not Wisconsin? Why can't Wisconsin be a team that, that can contend on the biggest stages? And just to see the turnaround happen as fast as it did was remarkable. I, with Barry, I, I don't know. I, I get asked, like, you know, best coach ever at Wisconsin, Wisconsin athletics history, and that's a tough one, but I don't know if there will ever be a more important coach in the history of the of the institution than Barry Alvarez because you've got to have football. Football's got to be good. It just does for everything else to have a chance to succeed, and it wasn't. You know, not only the team was bad and it, apathy set in, which is the worst thing that could happen with a program. And a few short years later, it was the hottest ticket around to, to see Badger football. And at the Rose Bowl, Camp Randall West, where thousands of fans couldn't get tickets, so they're watching in the parking lot outside the stadium. It was something that probably only in the wildest dreams of Badger fans would they ever, ever see that. And then they got to live it. Hard to believe that was 31 years ago now. It's hard. It's hard to read. So, I mean, look, I think it's super cool because uh, when Barry, when I said yes, Barry was thinking to go to Miami. And I was like, oh, man, you know, I don't really have that much cult, like history behind it. But um, I wanted to play for Barry. I mean, that guy, you're right in in how he built his program. He he made people want to be competitive, hardworking. And he always said, like, you better bring your lunch pail. And that's what, for a fullback, that's what I wanted to be. Like, I want to beat you up in the fourth quarter. I don't need to take your lunch money first play. But in the last three plays, I want to let you know you never want to come back to Camp Randall and play against me again. Like, that was my goal was the, the longevity of the game is to beat you up. Um, and I think that is where Barry steps in. And he would always say, let's compete in the fourth quarter. But i got to ask you about probably one of the coolest Matt Perkins, not uh, the White Whale, um, Aaron Gibson. We're not going there yet. Although Gibby, if you're listening, I want you on the show so bad. It's, it's <laughs> unbelievable. Um, but, uh, but, but what, what, what happens, you know, like the 94 Rose Bowl team, and then there was a lull for a little bit. And then you have this guy from Jersey show up and he becomes one of the best players to ever play college. And he's at Wisconsin. What was your first impression? If you remember of Ron Dane as a 17, 18 year old kid. I remember talking to Barry about it before Ronnie stepped on campus and he was saying, yeah, we got this 260, 270 pound tailback. And said, you mean fullback, right? Yeah. No, I said tailback 260, 270. But really? Uh, I mean, yeah, teams recruiting him as a fullback. I think one school recruited him. Maybe they plug him in a nose guard, you know, and, but you know, and you know, B white was you know, telling you the story in one of your recent podcasts about that too. And, and no tailback. So Ron's eyes lit up and just seeing him, seeing someone that big be able to move the way he did. And I always remember, to, you know, Brian had mentioned years later that Ron was a guy that, 
Now, Ron would probably tell you something different, but you, you, you tell him something and he gets it and he would go. You know, Ron used to always laugh about how Cecil Martin would have to, the fullback would get into his stance and then he would point, you know, like put his, put his arm between his legs and we know you're going left, you're going right. And then, but I, I think you know, the way Brian described Ron is that he actually, that you tell him what to do and he will do it. You tell him once and he'll figure it out. And just his ability, you know, to run as well as he did for as big as he, big as he was, obviously his ability to deliver a blow. I was all when he when he broke the record, the record breaking run, I thought was everything in the portfolio of Ron Dane. It had the shiftiness, it had the power, the speed, whatever, because he always wonders, is it gonna be a two yard run, a four yard run? What how's this gonna be? But when he broke the record, that was that was Ron Dane in a nutshell. Um the previous week against Purdue late in the game. It wasn't even a touchdown run, but it was a vintage Ron Dane run where he basically blew up some dude. I think it was a safety. It was a big first down that helped seal the game. Um, his ability to do everything and recognize his offensive line. You know, he was always, you know, I think he got on the shirts, O line, my kind of guys after his freshman year. And uh, he was, when Barry could not contain his excitement about, Two guys in particular over the years, Joe Thomas and Ron Dane. And in both cases, they were maybe even better than, than those guys <laughs> thought that they would be, and they thought that they could be extra special. It was, uh, again, best player ever, most important player to me in Wisconsin history is Ron Dane. So let's fast forward a little bit to broadcasting now and working with, cause I mean, let's face it, like you, you work with in some way, shape or form, the football program and the head coach, how has it been getting to know and getting to work with coach fickle over the last 18, 18 months or so, however long it's been. Um, what's your relationship like with him and how, you know, what kinds of discussions do you guys have, you know, off the air, on the air, you know, what's, how has your relationship been built? It's been really good. It's been a, it, you know, full disclosure, it's been a transition because Paul Christ is a good friend. And that was, a, that was tough, you know, obviously to see all that. Everybody knows the, the nature of the business and all of that. But, you know, Paul and I would talk about a lot of things and then we get around the football because we have common interest about being in Northern Wisconsin and, and that type of thing. And I thought he did a great job in his time at Wisconsin. Um, but we, you know, there, obviously there was a change and, and with, with Luke, it's, it's been good. We, we can, we're continuing to get to know each other. We're from the same state. You know, we we're familiar with different areas of, of the state of Ohio. So that probably helped to break the ice a little bit. Um, I did a little background on him with the, with my counterpart at the university of Cincinnati. My counterpart at Ohio state is a really good friend of mine. And they both said, you're going to love him. He's, you know, he, he's very accommodating. He gets it. That okay, that's good. And he's been like that because he, you know, he, he tells me what I need to know, you know, when we have our off air discussions and doing, you know, game prep and that type of thing. And on the air, he, he likes to have fun. In fact, the guy at Cincinnati, Dan Horde is his name. He's the radio voice of, of the Bearcats and the Bengals. And he said, Hey, just, I just want to let you know, once he gets to know you a little bit, he's not going to be afraid to bust your chops. So just, just be ready. And he, he's spot on. He'll do that with me and especially Tausch. Tauscher, which is really enjoyable. Anytime Tauscher is getting busted up, it's always kind of fun to fun to watch and listen to. So, but he but he gets that kind of stuff, and there is a switch with him. You know, when he's coaching his team and you know putting them through the you know the rigors of a practice and, and the directive with the strength and conditioning, um, it's really really intense. You know, Luke was an undefeated high school wrestler. He to this day he loves he loves wrestling. And just loves the physical nature of football and the intensity. He was a nose guard for crying out loud. But for for me, he's been he's been great great to work with. And as we continue to get to know each other, uh, hopefully that'll continue to get better and better. But it's been off. I, I think. He might tell you differently, but from my corner, uh, it's been really, really good. You've been working with Mark Tauscher now for a little bit. What is what do you like about working with him? And what is the strangest thing that he does in the booth? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, ooh that's, a, that's a great question. It's, it's been fun because he is funny. He's a funny guy and he's smart. You know, they, they see a guy like him with the long sloppy hair and he's got the hoodie and all that. Uh, don't be fooled. 
is a really, really bright guy. And as I said earlier, he's he's really owned his craft as a broadcaster. You know, he does a daily radio show uh, in Madison. It's on in Milwaukee as well. Um, and he works with a writer, Jason Wildey, who covers the Packers, uh, one of their beat reporters. And there's a really good rapport there. And I think Mark and I have a, have a good rapport as well because he does. He knows that at the end of it, it's supposed to be fun. Um, and, and the player perspective, I mean, as a play-by-play announcer, I'm watching the ball. Who has the ball? Where is it going? And what's the down and distance? What's the score? What's the time? And then Mark will tell you why a play does or doesn't work because he's watching the offensive line. He's watching how the D-line and, and the linebackers are adjusting to what's going on. So he's there is that mix. The, the, the thing about Mark, Matt Perkins, is that you never know what he's going to say when. I mean, we're at, we're at Purdue it was a Friday night game last I think last September, late September. And all of a sudden, you know, they, Bernie, you know, you guys both know this. They have part of their band. They tout having the world's largest drum. You know what I'm talking about? And just out of the blue, Tauscher on the air is saying, I don't think it is. That's not the largest. How do we know that's the largest? How do you respond to that? I, I have no <laughs> idea. And just – third and seven now at the Wisconsin 42 yard line. And you try to get back to the game. And, but the one thing about him, he's not, I I consider him a very well-rounded guy, but at the same game, they were at halftime and normally Tausch and I will go get some coffee, whatever. And then we come back in the booth. Well, the halftime show was a salute to yacht rock. So I thought as the, as the kick to the second half is ready to, to happen, I thought, okay, now I want to pull. I want to pull a Mark Tauscher of my own. I was said something like, "Well, it was, it was really pretty cool to see a salute to Yacht Rock hit the Purdue halftime show." Even the public address guy went into that into that Yacht Rock voice. You know, hey, here's, <laughs> here's Christopher Cross. Tauscher had no idea what Yacht Rock is. I don't know if you guys do. Are you kidding if you me? Don't, Steely, uh, Steely Dan, like you said, yeah. yeah like the, oh, are you kidding? That is one of my like. <laughs> Doobie Brothers, like quality, quality, Michael McDonald and all the good stuff. The really good stuff. Yeah, he stuff. had no idea. So I thought I would try to out Tauscher Tauscher. And I think for <laughs> one time I was I was able to do that. But he <laughs> loves to play word games and he had when we do these shows with Fickle. Um, before home games, we did we last year anyway. We did it in front of a, a, a nice little audience in the south end zone portion of the stadium, and they go they'll go back and forth over stuff that like if you're looking for an in depth analysis of the game against Alabama, you're probably not going to get that, but you will laugh, <laughs> particularly with the when those two, the old lineman and the nose guard, go at each other. Well, didn't they play against each other too? They uh, they did. I, although I think Tausch it might have been a. I don't, I don't think Tausch was Maybe on. It was year. It was, um, was Fickle's last Tausch. year was 96. And, you know, Tausch ended up playing through 99, but he wasn't, as okay. uh, as Fickle said, I don't really remember you. I remember Chris McIntosh, but I don't yes. remember. Right. Um, or maybe, uh, see, Engler probably in 96, and then Casey right. took over yeah. you know, the, the following year. So that's another jab opportunity for, uh, for Luke <laughs> Fickle on time. So we've only got a couple love, minutes left here, but one of the things that I really wanted to talk to you about was your work with the UW Initiative to end Alzheimer's. Um, first of all, that is a phenomenal uh, mission to work for. What made you want to uh, you know, spend a significant amount of your, your time and resources um, you know, with, with this group? Well, my, my mom passed away from Alzheimer's uh, seven years ago now, almost almost to the day as we record this. And she had battled it for several years prior. And, and what we found out in, in this whole process, you didn't have to go very far to find somebody else in our world, even who was dealing with the same thing. If it was friends, acquaintances, coworkers. Um, and the more we learned about it, uh, the more eye-opening it was as to how many people deal with this. And it, it's, you know, it was, it was heartbreaking to, to watch, even, you know, even though we were 500 miles apart, I would get back home when I could. And the last two or three years, especially each time I went home, you could, you know, the progression of the disease was more and more noticeable. So, you know, that was, as I said, a very tough thing for all of us in the family to, to, to watch, you know, that, that type of a journey, but the Steve Ramey from the UW Foundation reached out because they had done part of the uh, the Champions Tour 
the, the American Family Insurance Golf Tournament here. They, there was a, a stretch of years where there would be various charities that would be helped. And part of that was the UW Madison's initiative to end Alzheimer's. And I really did not know the extent of the research and the work that was going on right here at, at UW Madison. And uh, Steve and I connected and then got to meet some of the, some of the doctors and the researchers, Sanjay Astana, Cynthia Carlson, Nate Chin, uh, Sterling Johnson, that group. And it's a, uh, it's amazing. The research um, there's, there's, there are things going on at UW Madison that are going on at very few other places in the world to try to find ways to, first of all, come up with ways, lifestyle adjustments that can help you maybe prevent it. Um, and then hopefully be able to come up with ways to slow the progression of it. And, you know, maybe one day, you know, find a cure, but now just trying to come up with ways for early detection and then being able to treat it and, and slow the progression of it. So I would like to thank, and I, and I truly believe that when those breakthroughs come through, uh, when those breakthroughs happen, um, much of the credit will go to those at UW Madison. So if there's a chance with the platform I have to help out now and then, um, I, I just, I think it's the least I could do. And we will share the link to donate, uh, to, uh, the, uh, UW initiative, uh, to end Alzheimer's here in the show notes and, uh, any help, uh, you guys can give them is, uh, is really important. And it's a, it's a very you know noble cause. And I think that, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's very, telling of your character that you would spend your time doing that. Um, so I, I, you know, I think that's just a, a really cool thing. So, um, I appreciate it. Yeah. Bernie. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Matt LePay. And we're using everyone's last name because too many Matt's <laughs> in one room. That's what they say. Is this but, podcast um, history, by the way, the first time it's been Matt and Matt and Matt, let's just no, say it this. Ha- it's happened before, but we can say, it, we can say it is, Matt. but I think it's happened before, but I don't, I can't remember. It's definitely happened before. <laughs> I would have to go back and look in the archives, Bernie. There's 222 episodes. Sometimes like I'm said. like, we should have this person on. I'm so excited about it. Matt Perkins. Like, well, we had them on like three years ago. I'm like, oh boy, let me go. Through, let me go take a look at that list again. <laughs> um, uh, but Matt LePay, uh, I want to end on two different things. Um, you know, Wisconsin has their top 100 that, you know, in camp Randall top 100 coolest things that they've ever seen the Matt Shaver play. I think I'm 101 with the Yom Kippur game because I wasn't top 100, which is okay. I'm a little salty, but it's okay. You should have been but on what, there. Yeah, you should have been on Yeah, there. it's all right. There, You know what? There have been a lot of cool things that happened in uh, Camp Randall. Um, what for you has been some of like the most exciting games? You know, you don't have to jump into it because we're running out of time. But what have been some of those nights or days that you're like, wow, this is so cool? Well, the, the Dane game, 99, you know, when he broke the record. Um, David Gilreath kick return against Ohio State, 2010. That, that lived up to the hype and then some. Melvin Gordon for 408 yards in three quarters. The record lasted a week because Stoops kept his guy in there for part of the fourth, I think, some IGP run. Um, but, yeah, those, those are the games that stick out. And not just because, you know, your game against Penn State, what you were doing – and that year, I know we're running long here, I apologize, but that your defense was so ridiculous that year. And this is no lie. I would talk to my counterparts of the team that you guys were playing or the SID, and they would think I was being a wise guy, but it's uh, who's your third quarterback? just in case, (laughs) because there were a couple that Penn State game was one of them, right? I think they had to go to the third guy because Mm -hmm. the defense was putting guys out. Yeah, Raz was just there putting guys out. Um, But that what you were able to do that night, you know, with AD down and thinking, boy, what's what's going to happen here? And I'm not not just not just saying this here, um, but that was pretty that was special. That was a special um, you know, the circumstances around it and, and everything, what you were able to do that night was, I mean, people, people remember that and people who were there, they'll, they'll always remember. That. Yeah. 20th. Matt, Matt, Matt Perkins, you were there, I, right? I, I, <laughs> what was I there? I've talked about this on the podcast before. That's the game that turned me from a, a, a UW student into someone who lives, breathes Badger football. So, um, yeah. that's what, yeah. well, thank you guys. Absolutely. It, it, listen, it was one of the coolest nights. My wife says she was there, but who knows? She liked the party before the games. So I don't know if she made it to her seat or not, but, uh, I won't ding her on it. It's, I, so I made her watch, Bernie. I made her watch so much film of me. It's like, uh, it's, she, eyeballs are bleeding. 
Um, we were watching actually on, on uh, we were watching at my house over the weekend, uh, 2002 high school, which I, I wasn't in. My brothers were in their highlights. And then we were watching on the Big Ten history. They had the 99 Rose Bowl. And we were picking out dudes that we knew Wendell Bryant was a freshman. Like it was so cool to see the guys. And they're like, who's Burke? I'm like, dude, that guy's nuts. Oh. He's awesome, but he was nuts. So it's like funny to like, I never played with that guy, but I know him. And it was just cool to be there. And my parents, like we're watching this game that I didn't play in. We didn't even really watch Wisconsin at the time, but how important it has become now. Um, and then, so Matt LeBay, last question for me, the big 10 is brand is new. It's evolving. It's not the Big Ten anymore. It's the Big 17, 18? 18, 18. Big 18. So what's what's super cool? Like, what are you most excited about, not only for our team, but for, like, the Big Ten, which you've been a part of for so long? Yeah, my selfish answer to that is, I mean, I feel like in my time at Wisconsin, and I, I was a fill-in guy with the Brewers for eight years, I feel like I've been to most of the iconic venues that are out there you know, through basketball, through college football. And, and, you know, I never got to Fenway Park or to Camden Yards, but it was at Yankee Stadium, obviously Wrigley Field, Dodger Stadium, all of that. Um, I have not been to the L.A. Coliseum, but that's where the Badgers will open Big Ten play at USC at the Coliseum. And in basketball, they're going to play at UCLA. So I've never been at Pauley Pavilion. I mean, those are two more iconic venues I can – check the box to, but this, this is going to be, it's going to take some getting used to guys. You know that. I mean, um, I, I remember when the big 10 had 10 schools and then Penn state, you know, shook the tree and became number 11, Nebraska made sense as number 12 and so on and so forth. Uh, but now truly a coast to coast league. I mean, these guys for football, they'll play their first big 10 game at USC. And then a couple weeks later, they're going to be at Rutgers. So that's the, you know, with football doable, I think we're all kind of curious to see with the Olympic sports, how is that going to work? You know, basketball this year, they'll do a trip to Southern California. Maybe next year it'll be to the Northwest, but they'll play USC, UCLA in one trip. Um, we're waiting to see how that's going to work for everything else, but it's, it's exciting. I think a 12 team playoff is, is really interesting. We don't have divisions now in the big 10. It's just one through 18, but if you don't win your league, you're still, you know, maybe trying to get yourself into the mix to be one of the 12. Um, it's going to take some time. I think the younger fans will, will probably grow to it uh, faster than, <laughs> than I will, but it's still, I think it, it is going to be, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And, you know, USC, the tradition, Oregon's really good. And this year, man, the schedule, Alabama coming here out of conference, you got Penn state, you got Oregon coming here, the rivalry game with Minnesota. This is one of the best non-conference schedules that I can remember. With you Wisconsin. can't find a ticket. Yeah. It's crazy. You can't find a ticket. It, it's like Barry came in all over again. Like they're, you know, people are asking me, can you get me an Alabama ticket? I'm like, no, I don't think there are any gone. left. But Penn State, people are like, I'm not going to Alabama, I'm going to Penn State, or I'm not going to Alabama, I'm going to Oregon. I want to be there for the first time they show up. Like, these things are so cool. And I think as a player, you would love to play, do this. Mm -hmm. Like, I know, you know, the travel's not easy. Like, going to California is kind of brutal, going to Rutgers, although that's a little shorter. But they, I mean, you get to play in all these really cool places and – your 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 visibilities expanded. I don't know. To me, all that stuff is is why you'd want to come play at Wisconsin. Yeah. Well, Barry used to always say he loved the big games, especially the home games. Well, they've got a few of them now. I mean, this is one of those. If you're if you're a fan, uh, Camp Randall is going to be it's going to be the place to be to be. And I think year two with Fick, I, I'm not smart enough to make predictions how many games are going to win, but I, I do think he's he has established his way of doing things, the culture. This is how we're going to do it. This is the intensity with how they're going to go about everything. So there's always going to be some surprises, but maybe not as many in year two. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to see what he and his staff will put together. This you year. almost opened up the door for another two hours of podcast right there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my wife will kill me if I go on any longer though, but uh, Matt LeBay, thank you so much for coming on. I, I mean, it, it's a real honor to, to be here sitting with you. Um, just the voice, your history with the team, with, with Wisconsin is so cool. And I, I don't know, it's just, it means a lot to have guys like coach white and you, you know, AD to be able to come to even have a podcast to come on and talk about how cool these things are, um, is, is fantastic. And congratulations on the Wisconsin hall of fame broadcasting hall of fame. Yes, sir. Wisconsin mm -hmm. broadcasting hall of fame.
No matter, there'll be more of those, I'm sure. You'll have more uh, <laughs> Hall of Fames in your future. But it's just really special to recap some of these things and, and hear your kind of perspective on them. Well, so thank you so much for taking the time. Well, I appreciate it. It's, it's great to be on with you guys. And I, I, like I tweeted after your, your uh, pod with B. White and Anthony, young fans need to watch that. You guys do a great job with it. I don't know about I'm dragging you down here, but those other ones are really it's a, it's a Badger history lesson that I think is required viewing and listening. So keep doing what you're doing. We really appreciate that. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time, and we appreciate everyone uh, tuning in throughout the world uh, to listen or watch or however you're consuming this. Uh, so thanks for tuning in to Believe in Badgers on the Believe Network, presented by BetOnline.ag and Oakbridge Wealth Management. Until next time, on Wisconsin. On Wisconsin.